Hi, this is William Ramsey. The following video is about the disappearance and death of Chris Jenkins that took place on Halloween night, October 31st, 2002. At the time of his disappearance, 21-year-old Chris Jenkins was an academic All-American and was a lacrosse player for the University of Minnesota. On the night of his disappearance, Chris Jenkins was in downtown Minneapolis at the Lone Tree Bar and Grill located at 528 Hennepin Avenue. You can see from this map that 528 Hennepin Avenue is in downtown Minneapolis. You can see that the Mississippi River starts at the top center of the map, comes down through through the center of the map to the southeastern part of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And to the right of downtown is the University of Minnesota. Note in this map from the downtown area that there are a number of bridges that cross the Mississippi River traveling northeast towards the University of Minnesota. One is the Hennepin Avenue Bridge. Another is also known as the Third Avenue Bridge. And there are a number of islands in this part of the downtown area. These bridges and islands will be referenced later on in this video. As I stated earlier, Chris Jenkins disappeared on Halloween night, October 31st, 2002 from the Lone Tree Bar and Grill in downtown Minneapolis. The Lone Tree Bar and Grill is located at the bottom of a Masonic temple in downtown Minneapolis. On the night of his disappearance, Chris Jenkins was wearing a full body Native American Indian outfit. This can be seen here. At half past midnight, a bouncer thought Chris Jenkins had urinated on himself and kicked him out of the bar, out into the freezing cold with no wallet, no keys, and no phone. Chris Jenkins was never seen again. After Chris Jenkins disappeared, Minneapolis police did very little to find him. The Jenkins family undertook an investigation of their own. The Jenkins family also decided to hire a private detective, Chuck Lesh. My name is Chuck Lesh. I'm a private detective licensed in the state of Minnesota. On November 2nd, 2002, it was a Saturday morning, I received a call. My initial reaction was that this is a very tight, solid, moral family that his missing for this relatively short period of time was egregious. Jan Jenkins, she had the look of hope in her eyes, but the deeper look into her eyes was the worst that had taken place. And I drove down into the vicinity of the Lone Tree Bar, which was located on 6 and Hennepin, and observed a husky guy standing on the sidewalk directing foot traffic, which we assumed was a uh, bouncer. He was the last person to see Chris alive that was an employee of the bar. He stated that Chris was escorted out of the bar by one of the security managers. He also informed us that he was told, don't let the white guy dress like an Indian back in the bar. His girlfriend was downstairs, and Chris was upstairs sitting at a bar stool, and he had a drink in his hand. Somebody bumped it, the drink spilled in his lap, looked like a soiled front of a pants, like maybe something that was inebriated. And shortly after that, a specific person, one of the three head managers of the fire security, escorted Chris out of the park. I went to Hennepin County Medical Center, went to ambulance dispatch, tried to find out if Chris or anyone looking similar to him had been picked up that night. I looked at the records and found out there was no John Doe or Chris Jenkins had been in detox. I found out there was no John Doe or Chris Jenkins in custody at the morgue. And we started figuring out that this is highly suspect. Cops didn't know where he was at. So the second day, it was more canvassing of area. We got more specific. I was going up and down Hennepin Avenue going to, I'd go literally to every, every building looking for security cameras. I'd interview people. I looked at security footage. There's always a gut feeling. And uh, when my gut tells me, there's something wrong, and if I don't go by the feeling, I take a beating for it. Uh, the gut knows, your, your sixth sense, if you want to call it that, always knows. But uh, we're not dealing in a sixth sense world, we're dealing in a world of facts. So you got to make the two match up. And that's not easy. I hope that the day will come when justice will be served in Chris Jenkins' case. When a person is wrongly taken out of his life, 
that there's an energy that is present that doesn't go away that seeks the truth and someone is going to find out the truth police reports clearly indicate that lesh had interviewed the bouncers and bartender at the lone tree bar and grill the head bouncer adamantly denied that chris jenkins was kicked out of the bar the other three bouncers became defensive and would provide no further information. The Jenkins family tracked down surveillance footage from the Hennepin Avenue Bridge overlooking the Mississippi River. The Jenkins family does not believe Chris Jenkins made it over the bridge. November 7, 2002. The Jenkins family takes the initiative and hires two bloodhounds to trace the scent of Chris Jenkins. The canine units hired by the Jenkins family detect traces of Chris Jenkins' scent at a parking garage near the Lone Tree Bar and Grill and by the Mississippi River at Nicolette Island. November 8, 2002. In addition to the canine searches, police officers search Nicolette Island near the Horseshoe Dam and the general Mississippi River area, including under the 3rd Avenue Bridge. The same area was researched by police November 11, 2002. And that November 11th search is clearly detailed in police reports. February 27, 2003, the body of Chris Jenkins is found in the Mississippi River. The body of Chris Jenkins was found in an area of the Mississippi River that was checked and rechecked many times by police. His body was found in water in an area close to Hennepin Island, known as the Spillway. You can see Nicolette Island to the north, and then south of the 3rd Avenue Bridge is an area where his body was caught. Right about here. Chris Jenkins was recovered 118 days after his disappearance. At the time of his disappearance, the Mississippi River was iced over. Considering the four-month time frame between his disappearance and discovery, his body was in relatively good shape. The body of Chris Jenkins was in an unusual position. He was recovered floating face up in the Mississippi River. Typically, drowning victims float in a prone position or face down. The Minneapolis police labeled the death of Chris Jenkins as an accidental drowning. Investigators Christy Peel and Chuck Lesh discussed the Jenkins case. About the theory that he was thrown off a bridge. That really couldn't have happened. The people that the police were saying were suspects couldn't physically have done it. If you've been to the bridge, and I've been to the bridge, there's a, a pretty wide gap that you would have to weasel your way off and then throw someone over. It would be virtually impossible to do it with just one person. At one point I was downtown with Steve and we looked at some of the other bridges. Would it be possible to throw him off of this bridge or that bridge or off the shore? And it still didn't make sense that Chris could have been thrown off of anything because of the way he presented himself in the water when he, when he was found. Chris's body was in a very unusual position. His body was in a face-up position, which is contradictory to typical people of his size. There's a block of ice in his upper body, and his legs were void of ice banging below the surface of the water, which indicates that he was probably placed someplace exterior of the river, perhaps on the side of the river. Also, his hands were crossed and clenched uh, on his lower thorax or below the chest level, which almost looked like they had been posed. Once I listened to what they were saying as motive and that he was thrown off a bridge, I exploded and said, I went ballistic. This didn't happen this way. Two investigators who studied the Jenkins case, Jeff Gannon and Lee Gilbertson, made the following comments in their book, Case Studies in Forensic Drownings. Chris's body was witnessed floating to the spot where it was recovered. It was recovered partially frozen, covered with some snow and ice, and frozen to a large tree branch. Our analysis suggested that there was only one way for those facts to have happened. We propose that his body floated rather than sank, since he was already deceased when his killers slid him into the water on his back. This was done at a spot along the riverbank that presented an easy approach on foot while carrying a body. His body floated a short distance along the bank of the river before it became hung up on a tree branch just below the surface. Whereon the river refroze, Chris was encased in the ice until the river thawed on February 27th. On that day, both he and the branch floated down to the eventual body recovery. The evidence suggested to us that Chris's arms were posed and that he was placed into the water on his back after death with the intent that he would be found in that ghoulish position and posture. 
A team of drowning experts checked the river currents in the spot where I was found and concluded that my body likely entered the water more than a mile away from the bridge. In the process of my looking at the river falls, it took me into the U of M river lab. And inside the river lab, they have experts, scientists, engineers, that their specific job role is to gather information about the river. They keep very accurate records of river flow, precipitation, weather, ice buildup, a number of different things that go into what's called uh, river modeling. And in talking to the head hydrologist, I came away with his theory, Chris didn't come from the downtown area. It just didn't happen. When the body came to rest at the Horseshoe Dam, it was a very large tree that, after interviews with horticulturists, we stated that tree that Chris was rested up against was not indigenous to the downtown area. The fact that that tree was there and Chris's body was there, one could reasonably assume that the tree and Chris's body flowed from some area in a very similar current in the river. The autopsy of Chris Jenkins indicated that he had GHB, a date rape drug, in his system found in a liver sample. From Case Studies in Forensic Drownings by Gannon and Gilbertson, we believe from the evidence that we have uncovered that Chris Jenkins was definitely murdered. Specifically, he was drugged with GHB, abducted near the Lone Tree Bar and Grill, held for a period of time, suffocated, posed on his back with his hands placed across his chest, then slid into the Mississippi River, on his back north of the Father Lewis Hennepin Bridge. They added that Chris was drugged, and none of the evidence indicated that Chris had been deceased for the entire time that he had been missing. The bruises that he always had from playing lacrosse were healed, which suggested that he had been held for at least three to four days before being killed. In 2006, after a review of autopsy photographs, Chris Jenkins was found to have a clump of hair in his left hand. Hair tests were completed in 2010 and indicated the hairs belonged to Chris. The question is, why did he have a clump of hair in his left hand? Also in 2006, the Chris Jenkins case was reopened by the new police chief, Tim Dolan. Upon review by the medical examiner, the official cause of death was changed from accidental drowning to homicide. Chris's parents did not accept the suicide theory. They knew Chris. Chris was a happy individual. He had lots of friends. He was not somebody that suffered from depression. They felt very strongly that this just wasn't like Chris. Well, the Jenkins family, I mean, they definitely were thorn in the side of the uh, of the department. And they had some communications, some stormy communications. And one of the things I remember saying when I, when I ended up having this case, I just hope that if this happened to my son, that I would have the courage to be that much of a thorn in the side of a police department. Because as it turned out, they were right. And uh, our assumptions were wrong. In the Chris Jenkins case, we did make a mistake. I want to apologize to the Jenkins family. Thank you. Thank you. It's a hard lesson to learn, but when you make a mistake, I think the, the biggest thing that you can do is, as an agency or as police department, as a chief, admit that mistake and then try to make it right. Chris Jenkins' case will be open. Uh, people will be looking at it, looking at new information long after uh, I leave or investigators that currently have it leaves. We have a big room for homicides, and there's big boxes in this room and those boxes will never go away. I just can't fathom that this would remain non-charged for, forever. So I would ask them for patience, even though that's the last thing they want to hear, I'm sure. In 2009, Jan Jenkins, mother of Chris Jenkins, published the book Footprints of Courage, retelling the story of her son's disappearance and death. In April of 2016, Jan Jenkins was on the Ed Opperman Report to discuss her book and her experiences. Here she talks about the discovery of hair in Chris's hand. We were told the information would be released to us about what they were told happened that night, and it never was. When we went back a few times in question, they said no, for this uh, to have any chance of prosecution, um, we, we just can't let this information out. And then, of course, it was our problem because we found out Chris had hair in his hand there were six people, three forensic scientists from the police force, and three medical examiners. Not one of those six, not one, had the courage to stand up and say, we need to test that hair in his hand. And how do I know that? Because we asked for the evidence bags, and they gave them to us. 
And we figured the reason they gave them to us is they, they figured we'd screw it up and then they wouldn't be any good. Right. Well, we didn't do anything with them. We had lifeguard systems at our house and Butch wanted to see the shoes because he said, if I see the shoes, I'll know if that kid was stuck in the mud at the bottom of the river or not. And uh, I, if, if I'm remembering cor- correctly, now this is like, you know, 13 and a half years later. Um, and these details I really try and throw out of my mind to survive. But um, so he wanted, he wanted to look at the shoes. And when my husband went down to open up the bin, we put them in, there was an envelope there and it said hair in left hand. No, actually, it was a neighbor. Sorry, it was a neighbor that used to teach forensics who wanted to look at some of this stuff. And he says, my, he looked at the autopsy photos and he called us one day and he said, my God, do you guys know that there was hair in Chris's hand? And that was another one of those, are you kidding me now? In the next clip, Jan Jenkins describes uh, other cases that are very similar to what happened to her son. And she provides some astonishing information. Welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator at Opperman. We're here with Jan Jenkins, author of Footprints of Courage. Once again, you can find her at LegacyofCourage.com. She's the mother of uh, Chris Jenkins, who was murdered under very, very suspicious circumstances. Now, Jan, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I want to ask you real quick. This witness in prison, do you know his name? Yes. Okay. What is he in prison for? He committed heinous murders after Chris. Okay, he he committed other murders, and did he plead guilty to those murders, or did he go to trial on those murders? I believe they went to trial, but he's in for life, which you know can be reduced, as we all know, to it's not really life. Right. Now, have you ever tried to contact him? No. Has anybody tried to talk to him? Yes, yes. I, I know that the sergeant has talked to him a number of times. I know that the retired NYPD did. I'm not sure who else because, you know, the only rights you have as a parent of a murdered child is to get media. Um, when you're in prison, you have all sorts of rights. If he doesn't want to talk to you or see you, you right. don't have to. But have you tried writing him a letter? No. And, and, and I... I I've, I'm not sure what it would get me because he's not remorseful because he's laughing about it because he thinks it's all a big joke and you know to do the things he did they did to Chris are funny my worst nightmare would be having to sit have to sit and listen to that I mean there's no sense of remorse or forgiveness that I've ever heard about or uh, sadness that he did it or nothing now, the NYPD detectives you're talking about, I believe his name is Coonan? Uh, no, it was Kevin Gannon Gan, and Gan. Anthony Duarte. Right. Now, these are the guys that they believe that there's a pattern called the smiley face killers. That they go, right. 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 Well, what is your opinion of that theory? Oh, there's something going on, all right. You can, and they work with Dr. Gilbertson, who's a professor of criminology at St. Cloud, Minnesota. You cannot have hundreds of young men disappearing showing up in water, the profile about the same age, a lot of them look about the same size, um, they're athletes, they're, you know, honors students. Where's all the kids that don't fit that profile? So I would not say to you that these are all homicides. I'm certain there are some accidents. I'm certain there are some suicides. But we actually had Chris's brother-in-law, FBI, take this set of circumstances a couple years afterwards and run it through their software program. And he came back and he said, statistically, this can't work. Well, duh. Do you think there's any significance that this happened on Halloween night? Yes. Um, The whole smiley face thing, I'm not, you know, there's, (laughs) there's a lot of creepy gangs doing a lot of creepy things, but smiley faces were left at a lot of the sites and, you know, evidence of, like, satanic rituals. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot to it. And it's not just Halloween night. Uh, a lot of these happen around holidays, including Christian holidays. Was a, there lot of, a lot of these young men had Christian names. Was there a uh, smiley face at the scene of a... Well, we don't really know where the body went into the, the river. 
Right. Um, as far as where the body was, no one will tell us. My husband and I suspect there absolutely was. Just by the looks on faces when we've asked and they wouldn't tell us. We just picked up on the nonverbals. We think it probably was. What You think what was it? There was a smile? That, that there was probably um, a smiley face. Okay. Chris was just fun. I mean, he was fun to be with. He did silly things. He kind of never knew what he was going to do next. Kind of the jokester impish in a way. He was the kind of kid that uh, really, he, he brought up the underdog. He was for the underdog. He made life, not just the destination or the end goal. He made every day an adventure. And he's the kind of kid that woke up in the morning, and whether he said it or not, you could see in his eyes, hmm, I wonder what today's going to hold. What's out there for me to discover today? He was fun. You can hear the entire interview Ed Opperman did with Jan Jenkins at Ed Opperman's YouTube site at Las Vegas PI.